Welcome to the Gridiron Studs Show. I am Chad Wilson, owner of GridironStuds.com and the Gridiron Studs app. And we're here. We're talking college football today, college football recruiting. And we are uh, already into the season. The kickoff classics hit off down here in South Florida last week. And we've got some major ESPN action coming up this weekend. Hope you guys check in and watch all of that and get yourself fully lathered up for the high school football. College football does also kick off this weekend. Florida State and Georgia Tech are going to solve their issues over in Ireland. Great. We're growing the sport. We're heading out to Ireland. Love that. Good, good, uh, definitely a good experience for, you know, the college football players on both teams. So that's a good thing. Some of those guys, well, let's just say the majority of them will never, ever go to Ireland again. So good for them to head over there and um, kick off this college football season. The real, super real action does start a week from now at the end of the month, August 31st, spearheaded by the big matchup between the University of Miami and the Florida Gators in the Swamp. I know many of you are looking forward to that. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing these shows each and every week with you talking about college football, college football recruiting, because we do love college football. Yes, they've done some things to poke us in the side over the last few years, but there is just um, no denying that the on the field action and the nostalgia and all of the fanfare of college football is just unduplicated by anything else that we have in uh, the American sports world. So for as much as they tinker with it outside of the actual um, gridiron, the the love for what happens on that field and in those stands each and every Saturday in the fall just cannot be diminished, I dare say. Though they might try. But anyway, coming up on the show today, just a little bit of news items with regards to some signings. I don't do a big part of that here on this show. We're also uh, going to talk about the NCAA flexing their muscle again. Wait till you see who they flexed on this time around. Also, got a prediction for you. I'm going to talk to you guys about what I think the Florida Gators record will be this year. Looking forward to doing that. As you know, I do the Two Chumps Football podcast with Emil Calamino, and uh, we've just completed going through all of the conferences uh, in the Big Four, so the SEC, ACC, Big 12, Big 10. We just finished doing that and then laying out our college football playoffs for you. What an interesting exercise that was. If you guys have a chance, go ahead and hit Two Chunks Football Podcast, see our latest episode as we lay out to you the college football playoffs. And, um, you know, over the last few weeks, we've been doing all of the individual conferences. So I did touch on Florida, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on that in this program. Talk to you about what I think Florida is going to end up doing this season. And then a little bit of a note there for you guys that are dual threat quarterbacks. And there are more and more of those in this day and age. I think we're probably going to move to a point where we don't even classify quarterbacks as dual threats anymore, since it's kind of a requirement of the position now that you be mobile or you're just not going to get a whole lot done. Nevertheless, we still have a dual threat quarterback category. And yes, there are guys out there that definitely run better with that football than others that are at the quarterback position. But I'm going to break down for you the things that you guys need to show on your highlight video if you're going to try to attract the college football offers and attention from college football coaches and scouts at the next level. So looking forward to doing that with you guys. If this is your first time here, or you've not had a chance to do it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. Otherwise, however you are listening to me right now, I'd appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. So whether it's podcasters, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, however you are listening to this right now, and if that is your uh, podcasting stream device or outlet of choice, uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and uh, make sure you don't miss out on another episode when it breaks if you're trying to reach me about anything that i talked about on the show today of course if you're watching on youtube the comment section is always open love those comments and love the back and forth in there so go ahead and hit the comment section otherwise you can email me c wilson at gridironstuds.com again c wilson at gridironstuds.com and once again man if you're a high school football player and you're looking to play at the next level there you absolutely need to be on the gridiron studs app i'll have a link to it in the description down below but basically allows you to come on there and create a profile with all of the information that you need to be recruited by college football programs. So that's your height, weight, 
track times, weight room um, information, stuff that you're doing there, pictures, highlight video, of course, uh, your bio, and then the uh, recruiting status updates that you're going to keep updated all along, uh, as well as stats. And again, everything that you need to put forth to show your worth and value to the next uh, level. So and any of the college football programs. And of course, we've got college football coaches using the Gridiron Studs app each and every day and week looking for the next group of guys that are going to come in and help their program. So why not put yourself there and uh, get the exposure that you need and put yourself before the very guys that can offer you those scholarships. So Make sure you do that if you're a high school football player and you have not had a chance to do that yet. Every high school football player should be on the Gridiron Studs app. So a couple of signings to talk about. Um, Oklahoma, a team that I'm, listen, people have had their thoughts about Oklahoma and Texas moving into the SEC and, uh, you know, Big 12's not the SEC, da-da-da. Okay, I think they're aware of that. But also, we're not bringing in any mid-tier Big 12 teams here. This is Texas and Oklahoma. And I think they will fare just quite fine in the SEC. They can lay their hat amongst the big boys in that league. The Alabamas, the LSUs, the Georgias, they're going to fit it just fine. And one of the big reasons is both of those schools have always been able to kind of recruit whoever they want. And that's just going to continue. There's a lot of money in, in, in that area of the country. Okay, Texas, Oklahoma, those wells of oil run it. And so does the, the money. And the names, Oklahoma and Texas, we're talking about the blue bloods of college football, and they're not going to have any problem there. They may even experience an uptick in their recruiting now that they are going to be playing in the SEC. That might fire up even more people to go and join uh, both of these programs, and I think they'll do just fine. Evidence of that is Oklahoma picks up a five-star tackle uh, three days ago, and Michael Osusi, six-foot-five athletic gentleman, um, probably projects as a right tackle. You know, these left tackles nowadays have to be giants. They're six foot six, six seven, six eight, especially at programs like this. But Texas, um, uh, Oklahoma beat out Texas as well as Oregon, Missouri, and Texas A&M. You're doing something when you beat out Texas A&M for a recruit in the state of Texas. So um, they, Oklahoma, comes into Dallas and grabs Michael Fasusi. Um, out of Louisville High School in Dallas, Texas. Had a chance to check him out on film. Here's the thing about recruiting offensive line when, uh, you know, at the high school level. It really is a tough thing. And that's why I think probably for, I might be saying something here, but I think high school camps probably are best and most beneficial for guys on that offensive line. Why do I say that? Because it does allow them the chance to go to the camps. And and I fully realize you're not padded in these camps. I'm talking about the recruiting camps and a lot of times some of the on-campus camps. Yes, they sometimes they you know might have you lightly padded, whatever. But when you go there, it's the best of the best, especially on the defensive side too. Because what happens to a lot of times, and you're talking to a guy that's watched a ton of offensive linemen on film in high school. It is very rare for a high school offensive lineman, especially left and right tackles, to go up against a guy that's going to resemble anything like what they're going to see at the next level. There are miles of film for guys of all all likes, five stars on down to three stars and guys that are no stars, that are going up against 195-pound defensive ends. Um, You might even see a 185-pound defensive end out there um guys that need to be athletic to rush the passer and that works for some of these teams in most games until they run into a five-star left tackle so you see them coming off the ball and mauling a guy that's considerably smaller than them or they go to that next level and they're hitting a linebacker that's that doesn't resemble anything like what they're going to be facing at the next level even when the five-star offensive tackle is going against a program with athletes a lot of times they only really have one marquee defensive end. And if that tackle doesn't have a guy, his equal on the other side, well, you know, a smart defensive coordinator is going to take their best defensive end and put him on that other side. He's going to be opposite of that five-star tackle abusing the lesser guy. That's just smart football. You are going to make the offense adjust to that and kind of probably stay away from the five-star tackle. Every now and then you do get those matchups 
you know, a big time defensive end going against an offensive tackle. Sure. But most of the time, as you watch the film, these offensive tackles are not going up against a guy that's going to be remotely close to what they're seeing at the next level. So a lot of these guys get recruited based on their dimensions. You know, if you're 6'5", you're 270, 275, 280 and up, 300 pounds, and you're carrying that weight well, well, you're a guy that's going to be heavily recruited. A lot of times it's not a whole lot on like the 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 film per se. They do want to see you moving around. Um, they, you know, they, they do want to see some of your athleticism there, but I'm here to tell you, if any of you guys have watched film, it's a lot of offensive tackles going against guys that they just clearly could dominate. That's why the camps are so good. They get to see them against guys like that, working against a pass rush and other various things that they do at these camps. So, um, that's, I say that because that's kind of the case with Michael Fasusi when you take a look at his highlight video um he's going against a lot of those types and yes he's definitely dominating them if he wasn't doing that he wouldn't be as highly touted as he is now but nevertheless that's the case oklahoma comes into uh dallas texas and grabs that guy the other big signing this week was uh for alabama acklin dare uh the number one ranked running back in the class of 2025 um out of uh, out of mississippi um, one of the top players in Mississippi, one of the top players, obviously, in the country, has now signed with Alabama. Well, not signed. Shouldn't say that. And we're going to hit on a little bit of that down in the show. Has committed to Alabama. So, um, Kalen DeBoer, as, um, they're not slouching around down there. The big thing that happened that people uh, paid attention to and talked about was what initially happened when Nick Saban left. Kalen DeBoer got the job. There's a lot of transfers out of there. And you got to understand that those things would happen. People came there for Nick Saban and then got a little scared. You know, some assistants left, went other places. So guys left and that got the headlines and the press early on. But as you look at it, Bama is still Bama. We will obviously find out this fall just how well Kalen DeBoer can coach in Tuscaloosa. We already know and had a chance to see what he could do in Washington. Got those guys all the way to the last game. That in and of itself is an accomplishment and should motivate people, and should um, at least have some kind of calm for Tide fans, but I know they're going to be hell on wheels coming up behind the Nick Saban era, so I don't know if if anything short of being in the title game or the Final Four is going to satisfy Bama fans, but the truth remains that Kalen DeBoer is a good coach. He's, he's put together a really good staff in terms of both coaching as well as going out and recruiting, because right now the Tide have the number two ranked class in the class of 2025. I know we're a little early, but only Ohio State is ranked ahead of them. So um, obviously they've got the chops and Alabama name still holds heavy, heavy weight as you're out on the recruiting trail because, you know, they've been able to put together a class. But talking about Dare, he is uh, a no-nonsense guy, not a whole lot of jukes. He's kind of a one-cut guy, finds a lane, hits it, um, and that kind of suits what goes on in Alabama. Never. Been one to have the jittery type back there at running back. It is, you know, get behind your pads, coming downhill, get these yards, don't be playing around. So he's definitely an Alabama type back. Put up 2,000 yards last year as a junior. Hard to imagine him, barring injury, not doing the same thing this year, even though everyone will be looking out for him. But he's uh, that's kind of always been the case for him for a couple of years now. So, um, And with his kind of running style, um, we could see another 2,000 uh, yard season and him really pushing himself deeper into the history um, and the history books of Mississippi. So uh, two big signings in this past week. The NCAA once again has flexed their muscle. This is the same NCAA now that uh, has completely fallen back as the NIL thing has blossomed in college football. If I could use that word, they've kind of been hands off you know, you guys can kind of just do what you want. Every now and then now they come and poke their head in there and start slapping people on the wrist or really gripping the wrist. And as always, the NCAA tends to go a little bit harder on programs that they feel they can go hard on. And then they tend to look in the other direction with people that pay the bills. And you guys know who they are. I don't need to run through that list. If you're a college football fan, and I feel pretty strongly that you are, 
if you're watching the show, you know, you know, the schools that I'm talking about that just don't seem to rack up any of these violations, though they bring in number one classes and they are totally killing it in the transfer portal. They just don't seem to rack up any of these violations. You know who got a violation? Kirk Frentz, the elder statesman in college football in terms of coaching, has somehow racked up a recruiting violation that's going to put him on the shelf, him and an assistant on the shelf for one game. The opening game of this 2024 season is going to see Kirk Ferentz not on the sidelines for Iowa. I think they will be able to to hang. They'll be able to get it done. I mean, kudos to them. You know, it was a bit of a play. You know, you know what these schools um, tend to do when they go with the self-imposed penalty. So apparently uh, the infraction here is that Kirk Ferentz had improper contact with uh, a recruit, namely uh, being uh, Cade McNamara, who fell on the depth chart, obviously, uh, behind J.J. McCarthy at Michigan and decided to leave uh, Michigan and ended up at Iowa. Apparently there was improper contact before uh, Cade McNamara hit the transfer portal. And so that's going to put Kirk Ferentz on the shelf along with his um, his assistant. Ladies and gentlemen, do you not think that this is going on all across college football? When you see a guy jump in a portal and in under five days he's at another school, do you think that he just legitimately decided to jump in a portal without talking to anyone and within the space of five days spoke to a school, ironed everything out, and made a decision in five days? Have you guys at all watched high school football recruiting? Do you see how long it takes in that process for guys to make a decision, all the things that they've got to go through? If you believe that a guy goes in the transfer portal and in the space of 24, 48, 72 hours, makes initial contact with a school, talks, and, and gets everything sewed up, and now he's at another school, I have land in the West Indies I want to sell you. So basically everyone's doing this. In fact, NIL deals are being agreed upon and spoken about before guys are even in the transfer portal. I mean, who are we fooling? Why does the NCAA insult us like this? Here's how I look at the NCAA handing out or at least coming after Iowa because, you know, Iowa did, in fact, self-impose. But coming after Iowa, come on. NCAA, when you do stuff like this, you lose even more credibility. You know, we're no one holds the NCAA in high esteem as it relates to college football. But then when you do stuff like this, come on now, leave Iowa alone. It's hard enough as it is for them to acquire the kind of talent that they need to battle it out with the big boys in the Big Ten. That gets harder, of course, this year as you've got some new imports some upper tier teams from the Pac-12 coming in. But whatever the case may be, Iowa seems to be in the thick of things. I mean, Iowa's played in a couple of Big Ten championship games with all the talent that existed, all these other schools like Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan. Iowa has found themselves in the final game for this conference a couple of times already. Get out of their way. Come on. Kirk Ferentz uh, is somehow... Um, a violator of the rules. Yeah, in the true sense of it, you know, he did admit to the fact that improper contact was made and they do pride themselves on following the rules there at Iowa. But for God's sakes, for real, come on. Come on, fellas. But that's it. Um, we'll see who the NCAA decides to lean on next. I mean, is Vanderbilt in the crosshairs for the NCAA? We're going to find out. We're going to see that. Uh, time to jump on to a record prediction here, and I've chosen the Florida Gators as the one. I know I have some Florida Gator fans that watch this as, you know, Florida-based, basically. So Miami, Florida, Florida State, they all check in. And so um, it is my pleasure to do this. One of the big reasons why I wanted to take a look at the Florida Gators and uh, and give a little special attention to uh, their record prediction. Obviously, I've got some kind of a history with the Florida Gators with my two sons going there. But um, also, there's been much talk about the Florida Gators schedule. It is, without a doubt, the hardest schedule in 
college football this year. When you look at the likes of Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, Florida State being there from the middle on to the end of the season, and then you're kicking it off with the University of Miami, someone um, many people believe will be um, in the ACC title game, have a good chance of winning it and be in the college football playoff. When you're kicking the season off like that, and then you've got that gamut of teams, I even forgot about Texas A&M, who they have in, in week three. That's a tough road to hoe. And people were already in Gainesville and in Florida land skittish about Billy Napier. It's very hard to please Florida fans. But if I'm just being honest here, not having a winning season in your three years while you're at Florida is a tough pill to swallow. I don't care what fan base you are. And when you are talking about the Florida Gators who have some national championship um, rings in their, you know, on their shelves at home, this is a really tough to swallow. It has been since, good Lord, the D-Day era, uh, World War II since Florida has lost, had a winning, uh, losing season in three straight seasons. The last time it happened, 1945 to 1947. And I've already told you some of the names on this schedule that they have this year. Should it not work out for them, and once again, they have a sub-500 season. It would be the only, the second time in their history, which is rather, rather long, that they've been able to put together four straight losing seasons. Last time it happened, the only other time it happened, 1935 to 1938. And so there's a chance history could be hit up here for the Florida Gators. And uh, I've already talked to you about the names on the list, but... Here's my feeling on this. I've seen some wild predictions. Um, the haters out there of the Florida Gators have said 10 and 2 is likely. 3 and 9 is probably what's going to happen. I would say this. If Billy Napier and his staff at Florida flirt at all with the 500 record this season, you really um, should be clapping it up for that guy. And I know that's tough for fans who witnessed the Urban Meyer era and the fans who witnessed both Steve Spurrier and Urban Meyer uh, era where you, you brought home some titles. I know that's a tough thing for you to hear, but you've got to like divorce yourself from the past. You can remember it, but divorce yourself from that and understand where you are as a program right now. And that is you are not what you used to be. Things are different in Florida, and you have this schedule now. The SEC has changed, and you have these new imports, and you're facing one of those new imports at their place, Texas, in your season. And so you can't go judging this team, this program, this coach against anything in the past, most notably the Urban Meyer era, which I honestly feel has spoiled Florida fans and has continued to spoil them for years on end. This is why you prematurely got Will Muschamp out the door, um, and then you had problems keeping McNamara, and, you, and then you got Mullen out of the door. You wanted offense so bad in Florida, you know, just playing good defense and being a solid double-digit win team was not enough for you. You got Dan Mullen in and off rip. He was doing that, putting up points on the board, um, and – New Year's six bowl games, and then you couldn't, you, you you had a problem with that. And then I really think what happened towards the end of it was Mullen just threw his hands up like, well, F it then. You know, if you guys can't find, um, you know, some appreciation for what I've done here in these early years, well, uh, just whatever. We'll just ride this thing out. I'll get up out of here. You guys can fire me, and I'll take my money, and I'll go home. And the reason I have that feeling is, like, Dan Mullen's been in no hurry to go coach again after that. That's what would lead me to lean hard on my theory here is like he's just hey, enough with this enough with this crowd enough with the administration that's going to listen to the fan base so on and so forth. but again talking about the prediction the good things all right let's talk about the good things for the florida gators going into this season nine returning starters on offense including your quarterback graham mertz who showed some showed some good things last year you're bringing six uh starters back on your defense that's a good thing. You've done some good things in the transfer portal. 
Um, you've, you've done well recruiting, and some of those players you've recruited have now matured their way into the program. If they're not starters, uh, there are quality backups that will see time this year and provide uh, for whatever success it is that you might be uh, that you might have coming your way. So you've got an experienced team coming back. I think a lot rides on what happens in this game a couple of weeks. Your opener at home against the University of Miami. Win it. It probably gives you a good feeling, some good confidence to maybe flip a game that was on the schedule as a loss into a win because you go into your real season with a good feeling about your program. And that stuff is very, very important for a program on the edge like this. If you're in one of these upper echelon schools, Ohio State, um, you know, Alabama, Georgia, those types, you look at a opening game loss as, you know, setback, you dig down, you go hard, you just fix it during the rest of the season. But if you're Florida, who's had their struggles, as I said, three straight losing seasons, and then you start off the year 0-1, it can have a bit of a, not, I don't want to say a devastating effect, but it can have a, a strongly negative effect on you as you go through. Now, you do have a chance to come up from air. Obviously, the next game you're against Samford, but then Texas A&M comes to town. The good thing there is they're breaking in a, a brand new coach and you do have them um, kind of at home. You're playing the game in Jacksonville, so it should be predominantly a Florida crowd there. So... It's a, a, like I said, a lot's going to be riding on what happens in that first game, how the rest of this thing goes. We could see a situation. Let's just say Florida beats Miami in that opener. You could go, you could conceivably go five and zero oh before you head out to Tennessee, which, you know, obviously that's going to be a tough game to win at Tennessee. Tennessee is a solid team. They play very well at home. Yes, they've had their trials and tribulations in their series with Florida. But right now, I would say Tennessee's a better team and Florida's got to go on the road and play this game. You've also had your problems with Kentucky, who's your next opponent after Tennessee. And then the run of games after that is incredible. It's 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 uh, legendary. Georgia at Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, Florida State, it's hard to find those wins there. So what do I think is going to happen? The thing that bothers me about Florida coming into this season is you had five double-digit losses last year. And historically, I'm not going to dig into the roster. I'm not going to sit up here and, and talk to you about individual players on this team. I think a lot of people, when they do this prediction stuff, and I've been doing it for a while, get too caught up in, exactly what players are on the team. And because they have these players, they should win these games. They should win X amount of games. Having played, coached, and all of that, yes, you definitely need to have good players. But if you start digging into the players and you start using that solely as your predictor as to how a team's going to do, you will get disappointed a whole lot of times. There's a lot of factors that come into play here. It's the talent the culture that's there, how the talent meshes with the coaching staff, which is always difficult for people. And then you have a whole lot of what you're coming off of last year. And for the Florida Gators, the five double-digit losses last year really do bother me. It's hard to see a team historically go from that many, you know, what's the word I'm looking for when it's double-digit, solid losses to just turning into a really great team this year. And you know what a really great team for Florida this year would be, given this schedule, is anything above 500. 7-5, and 8-4 and four would be outstanding for Florida. That would be a major turnaround. And when you've had five double-digit losses last year, when I look at games like um, not being all that competitive against a Georgia team that was not the strongest Georgia team of the last few years. You lose by three touchdowns there. Um, you go to LSU, you get slapped around there. That's a three touchdown loss. Um, you play Florida State, who doesn't have their quarterback, who, as we saw, was everything. You lose that game home um, almost by double digits, you know, you lose by nine points. Those are troubling to me. And you, you have that mindset, you're bringing it into the next year and you've got these 
this gamut of games to run through. So in my mind, this is a five and seven football team. And I'm here to tell Florida Gator fans this. If Billy Napier and his staff can pull together a five and seven season, he absolutely deserves to be back in Gainesville next year. If he's a 500 football coach this year, if he's a seven and five football coach this year, you got to extend that guy. They've done well in the transfer portal. The whole Jalen Rashada thing um, um, uh, and and maybe some other mishaps that have happened there with the NIL aside, they've done a really good job recruiting. They've been able to grab some recruits that people didn't think they were able to get. They've done their thing in the transfer portal. Um, they got this whole thing together with Kamani McLean. We remain to see how that's going to work. There's a lot of upside potential there, and they didn't risk a whole lot. The kid's a walk-on. But you could see the movement there, and we are far enough away now from the Urban Meyer era where you can, like, let's start readjusting your mindset and understand you're coming from the bottom up. You're not from the top down anymore. So if your team ends up being... 500 or five and seven, as I predicted this year, or even seven and five, that is a win for a Florida Gator team that has Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, Florida State to close out the season and opens the year against um, a college football playoff hopeful in the University of Miami. That's how I see it. Now, is there the potential to go three and nine? Yeah. How would that happen? You lose that Miami game. You and you have a mishap with Texas A&M, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. I will say this looking at the schedule. Florida Gators, on behalf of the big three, Florida, Florida State, and the University of Miami, handle your business against UCF. If you fumble around against UCF and you let that program walk out of the swamp with a W, I think we'll all throughout the state regret it because this is the UCF team that proclaimed themselves national champs uh, about five or six years ago, 2017 season. If they go in there and they defeat, defeat any of these big three teams on their soil, we will never hear the end of it. And then UCF will definitely say they have replaced Florida in the big three. There'll be no doubt about it. And then people will be forced to agree on the heels of these three straight losing seasons, and then UCF is coming, it's going to really look bad. And then mentally, I don't know what that would do to this Florida team for the rest of the way. So you, in the early part of this season, you lose to Miami, you lose to Texas A&M, you got a problem. You lose to Miami, you mess around at all with UCF and end up with an L there. I think mentally you're going to be dealing with the wrong type of team the rest of the way. You could see a disastrous season. You could see three and nine, or is a, the haters may, may get their way at two and 10, in which case it's going to be hard to bring Billy Napier back. And then once again, you're starting over in the state of uh, Gainesville up there, the University of Florida. Once again, you're going to be tracking private jet flights and you're going to be going through that whole coaching change thing again which you seem to be doing every 2.75 years in Gainesville please make it stop but uh, my official prediction here as it was on the two chumps football podcast for the Florida Gators is a five and seven finish to the season that's how I see it here folks for the uh, Florida Gators read it and we would love to read you guys comments down here how do you think the Florida Gators are going to finish this 2024 season we've talked about their uh, ridiculous schedule all throughout, um, you know, the, the off season. That's been a big thing that people have talked about. So we already know that's the situation here. So let's jump on to some recruiting advice. Cause that's, uh, a lot of what's done here on the, on, uh, the gridiron stud show. We are, this is a recruiting outfit. Obviously I talked about it in the beginning, the gridiron studs app and all how all of you high school football players should be on there. If you're listening to this right now, if you are the parent of a high school football player, you definitely should be on that Gridiron Studs app again. We'll have a link to it down in the description down below. But I'm here today to close this out and talk to our dual threat quarterbacks out there, which are becoming more and more plentiful at the high school football level. AI, you know, out of necessity or just imitation because, you know, you see the Lamar Jacksons, you even see a guy like Patrick Mahomes, who's not really classified as dual threat, but he does move around well. And everyone is seeing the mobility that is needed 
at that position and everyone's kind of moving in that direction. So like I said, we still have a dual threat category. And so um, there's some advice here for you guys that uh, here are the things you're going to need to show on you guys' highlight video. And I'm going to lead this off by saying arm strength and accuracy. You're classified as a dual threat quarterback, so the given here is that you can run around with the football. The truth remains, though, that if you're going to be consistent and you're going to win football games, you have to make throws from the pocket. I'm from that school, and the evidence points it out at all levels, whether it's, well, less so in high school because you could just be a fully run team, even though that's becoming less and less a possibility, and, and still win a whole lot of high school football games. But when you get to that college level, you know, the armies and navies aren't winning any national titles. So you got to be able to throw the ball. And so since you're classified already as a dual threat quarterback, you know, the foundation here is your ability to throw the football, your quarterback. You know, so the uh, recruiters on film are going to be looking for a guy who can zip the ball into tight windows with precision. Going to need to demonstrate the capacity to make the required throws, whether that's short throws, the intermediate, as well as the deep throws. Typically, your dual threat quarterbacks can uh, can throw those bombs. All right, it's just kind of they've come out a little league with that. They were either running with the ball or they were throwing a deep 50, 60 yard touchdown somewhere. So you you're going to have to be able to illustrate your your ability to throw the ball now, which means a full modicum of throws. So that's be able to make the short, intermediate, and the deep throws. Um, and show your ability to adapt if someone is, you know, possibly taking away your legs. If they're going to go all out to take out, take away your run game, you've got to be able to make the throws and hurt a team. So being accurate on those deep throws is more important than being able to throw at a country mile. And we've all seen guys like that who could throw the ball 70, 80 yards. And it's fun to, it's fun to watch that stuff at a camp. It's entertaining, but it can be maddening during a game when you can't complete those passes, you're overthrowing them, you're way off, you're even throwing interceptions on those deep balls. So you got to be able to show some accuracy on those deep balls because we know that you you like to throw those. But um, being able to have some accuracy is going to be key for you. Also now, number two thing is having your pocket presence and your decision making. I consider decision making for all quarterbacks to be the number one trait. Um, that's... That's how these game managers, because that was a term that was, you know, really big a couple of months ago as they were going, Cam Newton put it out there, the whole game manager thing. That's how they make their living. That's Those are the guys that win these championships, those game managers. And you can't be an effective game manager if you're not making um, legit, you know, decisions out there on the football field, whether it's just leading your team or when you drop back with that football and you are, uh, computing what's happening in front of you. You're reading that defense and you, you're just making 40, 50 decisions throughout a game. You got to be really good at that. As a dual threat quarterback, you've got to be able to show, you got to be able to exhibit some poise um, in that pocket. Yes, everyone knows that you can run. Um, but like I said, you got equally crucial is your ability to make split second decisions in there. These things happen fast out there. You've got to be able to quickly assess the coverages, the schemes, and identify the open receivers and get the ball out. Um, and like I said, I find that to be one of the most important skills, whether you're a pocket passer or you are a dual threat quarterback. So uh, you want to be able to demonstrate that um, on film. The next thing, obviously, is your mobility and escapability. And, you know, obviously that's one of the defining attributes for a dual threat quarterback, you know, is your mobility. You know, your highlight reels should showcase your ability to extend plays with your legs. Otherwise, why are we calling you a dual threat quarterback? And that's whether you're scrambling for yardage, so you're hitting them up for big, big yards, 50, 40, 50, 60 yard touchdowns, as you will see dual threat quarterbacks do at the high school level. But also it's your ability to roll out, do the designed uh, pocket movement plays, the rollouts, the you know the quarter rollouts and stuff like that, and be able to execute that. But then also, you know, being able to escape in the pocket, not always take off down the field, stay behind the line of scrimmage, get yourself into an open area and find guys down the field. I think a lot of dual threat quarterbacks would do well to get really good in that area. That's where the really, really big plays come from i've always said the ball moves faster than your legs so i know you can run i know you can do it yourself but if you can find a way to have a happy medium between knowing when you actually really need to take off and run with that ball but also just escape out of the pocket stay behind the line of scrimmage 
and hit a receiver 40 yards downfield, being able to demonstrate that is huge as well. And you know what? Your receivers will thank you. It's no fun for them to keep running down the field, um, running, you know, just be running these dummy routes, essentially getting open down the field and expecting the football only to turn around and see you running. And now they're turning into a blocker. That'll be cool for a little while, but after a while, it's not going to fly. You know, we know receivers really want that football in their hand. The fourth thing I would say is a football IQ and the field vision. Dual threat quarterbacks sometimes will get a bad rap as not being high IQ guys. Sometimes, you know, coaches' minds and fans' minds can get skewed by your running ability and they just start to pigeonhole you into the thought of that that's really all that you can do. Um, and the guys that run around with the ball and don't really distribute it like some of the others are just not really big high IQ guys. They can't read the defenses or they just not, are really in tune with how the offense works. Unfortunately, that is a, a bad rap that guys get. So as much as you can on your film, you want to show that you're not that guy. Beyond your physical abilities, they, you know, these coaches do want to see that you have an understanding of the game. And this is true for all high school football players, but we're talking about quarterback here, which is the most important position. So on film, quarterbacks should demonstrate an ability to have some field vision, show the ability to read the defenses, anticipate the openings. Anticipatory throws are really, really great. Not always having to see the guy open first and then throw it, throwing it into a window before a guy gets there. Those, those are great. Those show off your IQ, your accuracy, all those great things. Another great thing is being able to identify blitzes, and recognize coverage rotations and things of that nature. Exploiting mismatches that you obviously have. All these things are going to obviously help you win games in the fall, but then they're also going to look impressive to the college coaches that are coming around and taking a look at you. So I know it's a lot to put on your shoulders as a quarterback, but hey, that's the requirements of this position. You get a lot of praise. And this is the uh, this is the, the the cross you have to bear as a as as a quarterback uh, at any level. But as a dual threat quarterback, you don't just want to be a guy who's focused on your physical attributes. You want to be really in tune with the academics of the game. So you display um, a high IQ. And then the final part, all quarterbacks should show this. But again, sometimes this is a bad rap that dual threat quarterbacks can get that you're not the greatest leaders. You're a guy that just wants to do everything on his own by himself um, and just kind of try and put the team on his back. But, you know, you're not a distributor of the football. So you want to be able to demonstrate your leadership. Um, quarterbacks are basically the leaders of the team. I'm not telling you anything that you didn't already know. But, you know, being able to show the ability to show your, you know, rally with your teammates, inspire confidence, um, on films, recruiters will observe how the quarterbacks command the huddle. Um, they'll do that when they come in person, how they communicate with teammates, both in that huddle and then on the sideline, something that they can obviously do when they come see you in person. Displaying some composure under pressure and, you know, some resilience when the setbacks come in a game and we know that they will come, those leave a lasting impression on a coach. And so sometimes when it comes down to you and another guy, that's a tiebreaker for them. It's just your ability to be able to handle the pressure because that's what college football is going to be. Undying pressure each and every week throughout the games. And then who's going to be able to handle that and keep the rest of the other guys in the huddle calm. Uh, if need be the entire team, you know, uh, show leadership that allows the defense to go out there and do their thing. The really great ones have the ability to have a, a calming effect on the entire team, not just their unit, not just their receivers and things of that nature. So, and this is not a skill that you want to be turning off and on. To be elite on the field, you must practice this skill off the field. So, you know, you want to hone your personal discipline. Watch how your teammates follow you when you do that. Once you've got them following you and you're doing the right things, your team is definitely going to benefit. So a strong leader does, in fact, inspire strength in the teammates. All right. So these are the main things that you want to do. I'll throw one final thing in. Being able to be clutch in in games and in performance and game management, that's a big, big thing, too, because, you know, um, when you start playing the real games, they're not the cakewalks. It's not the games where you're up 28 nothing, 35 nothing at halftime. When you get into those postseason games or the tough district games or you got the, the tough preseason game with a lot of stuff's on the line, being able to show that you're clutch and that you can come up and make some big plays in big situations in big games. You know what they say, big-time players make big-time plays in big-time games. 
if you can show yourself to be that in those games, be Kyla Murray-esque. If any of you have ever seen his highlight video uh, from high school, one of the best highlight videos I think you would ever see at a high school level. Just his ability to get out there and make plays, whether it's scrambling around and making a big throw down the field, or it is taking off and gutting the defense for 20, 30, 40 yards or breaking it all the way. Just the ability to come up clutch in those games will definitely uh, definitely help you. So these are things that you guys want to be displaying on your highlight video. I hope you took notes on that. Um, as you put things together this season, you're going into that season, catalog that. And like I've say, said on several videos that I've talked about on this channel about putting your highlight video together, you have to start with those best plays first because those college coaches have so many videos to watch. If you don't capture their attention in this first 10 to 15 seconds, they very well can move on. So that first play has got to be something you want to hold their attention and you kind of, you know, it's not one of these major motion picture films where you're trying to build up to, a, you know, an end. Um, that's not how we're doing this thing. You're hitting them at first with all of that and you want to grab their attention. But make sure you put those things that I talked about in this video um, on your highlight video so that you can capture their attention and, you know, hopefully you're able to pull some of these things off this season and help your team and all of the best success. All right. That's it from the recruiting corner here. Um, and the advice that I give to you guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. And again, before you step out of here, um, give the video a like and a share as well as hit your comments down below. You know, uh, are you a dual threat quarterback? Are you a pocket passer? Talk to me about that there. And then, you know, anything else that you want to comment about that happened on the show today, any comments, questions, go ahead and hit me down in that comment section if you're watching on YouTube or send an email to cwilson at gridironstuds.com. One more time before you head out, if you're a high school football player, a parent of a high school football player, get on that Gridiron Studs app now. Hit that link in the description, download it, and put your profile together today. I've got scouts, uh, my own personal scouts on the Gridiron Studs checking out guys. So, we may drop an evaluation on your profile. Definitely want to read that because the biggest strength you have, the best skill you're going to have as a college football hopeful, as a high school football player, is self-awareness. Knowing what kind of player you are helps you in the biggest way in your college football recruiting process. So um, our scouts are there waiting to evaluate uh, your profile and your highlight video. Make sure you put a highlight video on uh, your profile all right guys i'm out thanks for watching and until next time good iron studs be seen